Are you okay with lights on? Yeah. yeah. Lights on. Okay, so welcome. Thank you very much for coming to my workshop. Um, it's called Design Thinking in the Library, the Fifth C. As I mentioned in the little short blurb that I gave in the main conference hall, I went to a conference a few years ago and saw some speakers um, who were talking about design thinking. And they weren't necessarily talking about it within a library context, they were talking about it within an educational context. And so um, one of the ones that really, one of the speakers that really inspired me were, um, was a guy who came from a school in the US and it's an, an Apple supported school. And they basically are a design thinking school, the name escapes me right now, and it's a high school. So basically what the students do when they come in, um, they have ideas, they, they put uh, scenarios out there for the students to connect with, and then they go ahead and they use the design thinking cycle to make it all happen. And for me, when I was thinking about how I could use it within, within the library, within my lessons, not, less, not necessarily within library design, but within my library lessons, the big thing for me was that fifth C, that connection to the, the person or the, the human connection to the problem, that empathy that design thinking allows you to um, create as you go along. Um, so that for me is why I call it design thinking in the library of fifth C, because as I said, we have the four big C's that they've come up with, the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity, thank you. Um, but then the big one for me with design thinking was that the actual connection with the problem was explicit rather than implicit. There are lots of different frameworks out there, like project-based learning, you know, big six, you've got all these inquiry skills that you can do, but none of them actually explicitly include in their framework that connection, that empathy. So it's time. I love this because for me as a, as a teacher librarian, students should feel that the sky is the limit, that they have the potential to be anyone, to do anything, and for me I feel it's, it's part of our role as librarians to help guide them towards that thinking, to have that connection with our students, to make them feel that they are capable of anything. So the definition that I came up with was based on um, something through Harvard University's um, Teaching and Learning Lab, and it says it's a mindset and approach to learning, collaboration, and problem solving. In practice, the design process is a framework for identifying challenges, gathering information, but always at the end with the user in mind. So that's the reason for using the design thinking. Uh, yes, and I think one of the things that I mentioned in the little preface that I gave is that it also incorporates failure. Because a lot of times I think, um, as teachers, sometimes we're scared to have our students fail or we're scared to fail ourselves. We want our lessons to be great. We want everybody to be engaged. We want everything to happen beautifully. Yes. And we want it all to work according to how we've got it written down and set out. But that's not life and that's not how it always works. So what I love about, the other thing I love about design thinking is that it allows you to fail. And it's such an important part of life that I think a lot of times now we're trying to build our students up to, to not failing. And I don't think that's fair to them because when they go out into the real world, they're going to need to be able to say, okay, yes, that didn't work. I failed. I now need to go back and rethink. So here's the design, th the design thinking cycle. So you start, or you don't start, but the five elements are you empathise, so you understand the perspectives and needs of your end users. You then define it, you use insights to define the real problem that you need to solve. You then ideate, so you brainstorm, you create a, you know, a variety of ideas through um, discussion. And then you prototype, so you're transforming those ideas into something that can be tangible, a tangible representation of your solution. And then, the next phase is testing. So you take your prototype and you test it and you observe it 
And that's where you think, okay, no, that one didn't work, I need to go back to the drawing board. Um, I need to go back and take a look at my end user. Is that really who I was designing that for? Or was I designing it <coughs> for something else? And you don't always have to start at the beginning and go through to the end. Oftentimes, some of our greatest um, inventions have come through starting in the middle, thinking, wow, I've got this great idea to do this, but where can I use it? Who could I use it for? And how do I make it happen? So you can start in the middle and work to the end and then go back to the beginning. But as I said at the outset, for me, the biggest thing is that connection. It's always with a user in mind, that, that human connection, that empathy, that understanding, that somebody needs that for a reason. Sorry about this, I, I don't normally use notes, but so you can have it um, on my screen there, but it's not happening. And it's not actually coming up the way that I designed it either because it's on a computer. Never mind. So, so why use design thinking? Okay. Why, why use it? And I think, for me, as I said, it was that big connection, the, big, the fifth C, and the fact that the children can fail and you can fail along with them. Because we now as teachers, with the way the world is moving and the way that we're connecting globally with, with each other, with different people, and the children now have access to so much information out there that they need to be able to choose what they connect with. And we need to become facilitators rather than directors of information, which you know, I assume most of us are. Because I think what we all already do is we teach using design thinking, it's just that it's not actually being set out like that. So we might have thought, okay, now I get the steps. We probably all, I'd say we all do it anyway. So, um, and as I said, I loved it because the, the connection, the empathy is explicit and not just implicit as it comes along the way. So, it stays focused on the human need at every step. So that's what you have to keep in mind. Um, it encourages difference and it empowers innovation. So nobody's idea is not good enough or wrong or whatever. And that definitely helps empower your students thinking that, okay, my idea is great. So, okay, it might not work with this, but let's try with that and talk to another student about how they can make it work. So that's very empowering for our students, I think. And it gives students the freedom to discover and create their own learning. Now, I'm not saying that we just put a problem in front of them and say, okay, kids, go for it. They obviously need some kind of guidance and help along the way, but that's where we're a facilitator rather than a director of learning. And it makes the learning more meaningful for them as well. So they have that engagement because it means something to them. And it encourages and celebrates failure as part of the creative process, which I think is a really important thing. So, and for me, when I tried it with my students, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a bit of a hoot, actually, because some of them really got it and they really ran with it, and others were like, mm, yeah, I'm not so sure how to do this, because it was the first time I tried it. But um, I think all of them thought at the end of it, um, when I spoke to them, that they, they learned that they didn't have to get it right. It didn't have to be brilliant the first time. That it was okay if it wasn't. And it's a mindset. So, especially in the, in the country that um, I work in at the moment, for international schools, it's not, it's a bit of an no-brainer really, because I think, you know, we all do it anyway. But I think in terms of local school populations, it's a little bit different, the way that education is done in uh, Vietnamese local schools. It's a bit, well, it's very different to the way it's done in international schools. So, to try and encourage that with local schools as well as international schools is a challenge, because it's a mindset change from being the director of learning out there saying you will do this, you will do that, and then okay, we'll see what you've done at the end, to being a facilitator and saying, okay, here's something for you to look at. What do you think you can make it? How do you think you can solve this problem? 
And on when you do uh, when you get the link to the presentation at the end, the five most important job skills for the future. What do you think number one is? Communication. It's in there, but it's not number one. That's one of them. Creativity. Creativity is also in there, but it's not number one. Collaboration is also in there, but it's not number one. It's yes, it's in there, but it's not number one. It's emotional intelligence. So that's why design thinking for me is the perfect framework. Because they're saying that the jobs that our students will be going for in the future, that that is the number one skill that employers will be looking for, is emotional intelligence. So their ability to connect with the problem and to connect with the people around them. Now I found that really interesting. I think it's interesting because you're right, a lot of the stuff now, when they're working in the lab and thinking about Google, it's online. You don't have to be a Google person on my side all the time. When they're doing presentations, it's like that, it's not like this. Yeah, exactly. And I think the, the, the little bit of um, design thinking that we'll do at the end doesn't require any technology. It's not that there's not a place for technology. I mean, I'm using it now, and I use it all the time in my library, in my lessons. But I think we need to have that balance. And 